All right. So today we have two guests, which I'm really excited for. This is the first time since I've been hosting DT Breakfast that we've had two guests. Um, so I will introduce them very briefly. And then after that, they're going to introduce themselves. So for our first guest this morning, we have Dr. Edson Kabalfin. He's an educator, architect, designer, curator, and historian. He is the newly appointed Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion in the School of Architecture at Tulane University, where he concurrently serves as the Director of the Social Inno Innovation and Social Entrepreneurship Program and Professor of Practice and Design Thinking. Dr. Kabalfin's research in the last two decades have focused on the interdisciplinary and transnational intersections of architecture, history and theory, cultural studies, gender and sexuality studies, post-colonial theory, Southeast Asian studies, spatial justice, public interest design, and heritage cons conservation. Woo. Um, so that's just a little brief, um, you know, bio about Edson. Um, I'm next going to introduce our second guest, which is Dr. Leslie Ann Noel, who is the Associate Director of Design Thinking for Social Impact and Professor of Practice. Dr. Noel teaches design thinking courses for the social innovation and social entrepreneurship minor at Tulane. In her professional practice, she draws on the fields of design, anthropology, business, and education, to create product development and business strategies with stakeholders. Dr. Noel focuses on developing design curriculum for non-traditional audiences and promoting the work of designers outside of Europe and North America. She has exhibited work at design exhibitions in Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaican, Jamaica, Brazil, Germany, France, and the United States, and she has presented peer-reviewed papers at design conferences in the Caribbean, the US, the UK, and India. So those are our amazing guests this morning. Um, I'm really excited to see what they do, and now I'm going to pass it on to them. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you so much, Naisha. I'll, I'll be starting off with uh, my uh, very brief talk and and afterwards uh, Leslie and I uh, Leslie we also then presented and Leslie and I uh, will be having also a brief conversation but we'll have uh, more uh, later on so let me just quickly uh, just start off uh, by just just share my screen for a moment can you see my screen so I think yep, that, I can see it Thank you. So I think like what the what, what I'll be trying to do just this very quick uh, uh, presentation is just to provoke, uh, pre present questions and provocations, and then really maybe just define certain terms. Um, I'll, I'll talk about uh, colonialism and and its connection, of course, with decolonization to set up uh, a possible then discussions also later on. Uh, about design and decolonizing design. Um, we, we, th this will not be exhaustive and this is not gonna be comprehensive. Um, and I'll also be speaking also primarily as, uh, as an architectural historian uh, coming from the Philippines and then contextualizing uh, colonialism also uh, in reference to that. So I'll start off with just what is colonialism, um, you know, because these are sometimes these are terms that are very loaded and are also very abstract in certain cases. Uh, but by colonialism, I mean as a practice of domination, uh, which involves the subjugation of one people to another. Uh, and colonialism can also refer to the process of Europe European settlement and political control over the rest of the world, uh, especially uh, as it affects the uh, Americas, Australia, and parts of Africa and Asia. So it's a, it's a process that has been happening for centuries, uh, but then later on um, also then had impacted uh, a wide area of the world. Um, and, and I also speak from this uh, important point in time because a couple of days ago, um, the Philippines also commemorated the uh, the Battle of the Island of Mactan, which was considered in the Philippines as, of course, the first uh, act of resistance against colonizers, because this year, uh, uh, 2021, the Philippines is commemorating 500 years of the coming of Christianity to the Philippines. So this is so timely that we're talking about colonialism and decolonization when 
um, this was also then this is happening also uh, in terms of commemoration and uh, the I, the Battle of the Island of Bactan uh, shows the uh, Portuguese uh, explorer Ferdinand Magellan you know coming to the Philippines and then eventually being killed by the local chieftain uh, Lapu Lapu. And so uh, in terms of col colonialism and the process of colonization, we always see uh, very similar tropes or very similar operations, including dominating, subjugating, segregating, uh, creating hierarchy, paternalization, eradication, assimilation, and surveillance. And while these are very abstract terms, sometimes you know, it feels like these are very abstract terms, um, there are actually, these are palpable uh, operations. Um, we feel this, and, and again, that's because I talk from the point of view of an architectural historian. Um, uh, I've studied a lot of these operations, especially as it relates to the built environment. Um, and I'll just show you a couple of examples of what I mean. Uh, for example, here is a plan of Manila in the 19th century. Um, the the, the uh, walled city on the right is Intramuros, which is the walled city that was established by the uh, Spaniards uh, in 1575. Um, there was a Muslim settlement there uh, when the Spaniards arrived and they eradicated and they killed off the local natives who were living there and established on top of it their walled city. And then the one on the right shows you the, the uh, sorry, the one on the left shows you uh, the suburbs that eventually emerged from uh, the city because uh, only Europeans were allowed to live inside um, the walled city here on the right uh, by the mouth of the river and then over across the river were all of the other suburbs where natives like the Chinese, um, the Japanese, and then native Filipinos were only allowed to live. Um, this is the Parian, which is a Chinese quarter right across the river. And so uh, the natives and other Asians and non-Europeans were basically segregated and isolated away from the city. Um, Spain, uh, with, with Christianization, as I've said, coming to the, to the archipelago, um, built churches. And so uh, the churches, for example, were signs and symbols of Christianization, but also were dominating figures uh, across the landscape all across the archipelago. When the Americans came in uh, 1898, uh, and the Philippines then becoming an American colony, um, there were military, American military uh, presence at the beginning, um, and later on, uh, education and the civiliza civilizing mission was, was through different efforts, uh, such as uh, healthcare, uh, sanitation, education, uh, and then also uh, through architecture and civic uh, city building, uh, such as uh, when Daniel Burnham came, uh, and replan the city of Manila uh, in 1905. And, and later on also other structures across uh, the islands were also, uh, colonialism was then also felt uh, uh, evident uh, as, they, as the Americans also built uh, neoclassical buildings uh, and other civic structures all across. So in other words, you know, all of these different efforts were uh, about, or uh, the idea of colonization was also deployed through the built environment. Um, the other part that also um, was uh, sort of used uh, during the colonial period was the idea of hierarchy and how Filipinos were then portrayed as inferior to uh, the Americans or to Europeans. Um, these are uh, exhibits from uh, the, the 1904 St. Louis Fair where there were villages that were built and this was part of my research and how Filipinos then were portrayed often as primitive and exotic through not only their, their sort of clothes, but also through their architecture as it was set in contrast with uh, some of the crystal palaces uh, and white palaces uh, in a lot of these expositions. So uh, colonialism is palpable. Uh, it manifests in many different forms. It's also uh, not homogenous. Also, it, it varies from, from contexts and places. Uh, but uh, one of the things that is also then uh, critical to think about colonialism is how uh, its legacies, in fact, continue until today. Uh, even though the Philippines, for example, similar to other countries, have become independent after 1946. And so Partha Chatterjee, an Indian uh, philosopher and, and theorist, for example, says that even our imaginations must remain forever colonized. So then how do we decolonize and how do we look at colonialism? Um, and decolonization can be thought of as a process of questioning 
challenging and dismantling the operations practices, systems, and leg legacies of colonialism. So we can look at these contexts, and it's very complex uh, because the, the uh, co uh, colonialism as a system is also not one single thing. Um, but we can also think of decolonization as a, liber as a form of liberation and emancipation from the control, the domination, and the subjugation of the colonizers even after maybe colonialism has already been, or, or like officially uh, colonialism supposedly ended, or, or that then countries have become uh, uh, sovereign already from the former colonizers. And so to look at again, some of these operations of colonialism, uh, we can also think then of decolonization as a process by which then uh, we can begin to maybe liberate, we emancipate, we integrate, uh, we create equality, we empower, we thrive, we include, and then practice self-determination. Uh, so this, this could be then the shift that could happen from colonization to that of decolonization. So then what's the connection then potentially with design, right? Like, ooh, how out of the blue, like when your know, design comes in. Well, because design can be thought of also as part of these operation and also part of the process of colonization. And so therefore there's a possibility by which then maybe we can also decolonize design as a process uh, of this liberation and emancipation. And, and I'm just suggesting certain ideas. Um, this again, by no means, these are comprehensive uh, thoughts uh, in terms of what they are, but uh, just to kind of like propose again, provocations, uh, decolonization design might mean uh, shifting the power and privilege away from the European Western patriarchal, heterosexual, wealthy, able male kind of perspective, because that has been the dominant perspective, uh, not only design, but in other, uh, in many parts of our society and our, in, our thinking. Uh, decolonization in design can also mean expanding examples, identities and contexts in the design studio beyond mere tokenism. Uh, for example, in writing history books or looking at history, again, because I'm a historian, we can look at many more examples beyond, let's say, the white male uh, European examples that uh, have dominated, again, our textbooks. Uh, and this is also beyond mere tokenism. Just because you added a Japanese designer and just because you added, let's say, an African designer doesn't mean that you're already achieving or ex expanding the examples. Uh, and then decolonization in design might also mean including voices of historically marginalized communities within the design process. Uh, for example, indigenous peoples who have been eradicated, as I've said, you know, or have been removed from their lands or been taken out of their uh, homeland, for example, we need to be able to include them in the design process and, uh, and allow them to actually co-create the process uh, uh, for us and for, for, this, for society. And then also then, I think part of it, and then ultimately maybe the goal of decolonization in design is to, is to rethink design and how to make it more equitable, more diverse, and then more inclusive. So I would like to just end uh, with uh, uh, I get a question in terms of, uh, again, because this is not, uh, this is just a provocation, but, but also think about like, you know, how might design become a liberating and emancipatory process, uh, a pra pra uh, process and then practice. And so I end with this quote from Bob Marley, uh, you know, when I say earlier about part of Chatterjee saying that our, you know, must our imaginations remain forever colonized? And then I think the response to that, it's Bob Marley saying, you know, emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. Thank you. Edson, thank you. Um, you know, like that was an amazing presentation. Um, I knew that Edson would not disappoint us. And, uh, you know, Edson and I, we think in very similar ways and we come from um, maybe slight, slightly different backgrounds and perspectives. Uh, so I knew that Edson would start with um, a historical perspective, which he can do much better than I can. And then I um, decided that I was going to talk about um, what could this look like in action. You know, I'm a person from a former um, colony. You know, I grew up 
in a time just after independence. So it meant that I, I um, grew up, you know, in Trinidad. I'll date myself in the 70s um, and it was hearing then a lot of like just decolonial language all around me. Um, and I think that that significantly affects the way that I work today because I grew up in a time when people were just pushing back on everything, you know, and, and saying, well, you know, Edson talked about like removing, um, you know, some of the connection to the colonial powers. Um, that's the space that I grew up in, in Trinidad. So I'm also going to start sharing my screen. All right, and let me put it into presentation. Okay, are you, are you seeing my screen okay? All right, great. Um, so this was actually, so this is not my image. This is from a, a decolonization um, movement, but this was actually my profile, profile photo on Twitter for many years. Um, this, I guess this is the philosophy that drives a lot of the things that I'm doing. You know, um, I'm always trying to push back, <laughs> right? And that's part of the decolonizing uh, process. And um, I like this quote from Franz Fanon um, from The Wretched of the Earth, decolonization, which sets out to change the order of the world is obviously a program of complete disorder. You know, I, as a self-proclaimed anarchist, um, I liked what seemed to be kind of justification for disorder and chaos and anarchy, you know, by somebody from um, like Franz Fanon. I actually bought Wretched of the Earth um, because of this um, quote. And, and in my version, actually, the quote is completely different. So I, I have to go to the French version now to see what is it that Fanon actually said. But, you know, I think that this quote helps us to see that maybe decolonization isn't going to be comfortable it might not make sense but it it is us seeing what's wrong and us pushing back and changing things so um i wanted to move to this other quote from i'm a lurker on a list called the design user research and recently um the design user research group it's a google group and recently there was a lot of um, conversation about decolonization. And I'll share the link to these slides so that if you wanna see the original conversation, you can. But I loved this um, quote and I reached out to the author, Rachel Yim, to see if I could um, quote her. And she, came, she had this long list, like her own manifesto of what decolonization means. Um, and I, I share her list at the end of the slides. Uh, but I thought that this was really um, significant to decolonize means exploring Paris from the vantage point of Dakar. Um, to decolonize means analyzing Dakar in the ways that don't center Paris. You know, so some of us think that, you know, Edson referred to tokenism, you know, we add two people um, from the a brown part of the world and then we are decolonizing. Um, it's actually much more than that. It's it's more about decentering and um changing perspectives that might not look com comfortable, et cetera. So uh, to continue the conversation, you know, what is decolonization or decoloniality, which is another word that I use, um, which is from Walter Mignolo. Um, what is this when we move from theory to action? Uh, because some people uh, stay in the theory and I wanted to show what could it look like in action. Um, and I'm gonna use some examples from our work um, at the Taylor Center over the last two years. But before that, I'm going to pull up um, these, uh, a section of decolonizing methodologies by Linda Tuiwai Smith. And she talks about these 25 indigenous projects um, where she looks at the themes that ran through indigenous projects, um, decolonizing projects throughout the world. And she talks about claiming, I'm not gonna read all, testimony, storytelling, celebrating survival, remembering, indigenizing, um, critical reading, envisioning, uh, returning, de de democratizing, networking, protecting, discovering the beauty of our knowledge, so decolonial um, work, decolonial research will look different, maybe because we have these different aims. You know, um, when we look at the work that people are doing from this decolonial perspective, 
uh, it might be pulling in these types of themes, you know, where we're, we're, we're not necessarily dominating someone else through our research. Um, we could be celebrating survival, we could be sharing, you know, there, there are other aims in the work um, when it's done through a decolonial lens. So um, to now bring it back to some of our work at Taylor, um, I, I wanted to highlight some of the decolonial thread in our disorderly design experiments, you know, disorderly using um, Fanon's word. Um, you know, so we did this project um, about two years ago when we used to meet in person still, where we looked at the design process and we did this really critical reading and we started to think, okay, what's wrong with some of, with the way this is presented now? Um, we analyzed critically and then we decided to propose new ways of working, radically pushing back against um, the establishment. And, and so this is writing and theory making, reframing and discovering the beauty of our knowledge and knowing that, okay, our knowledge is good enough and we're gonna put it out there, right? And this work was done um, by me, Malia Fon and, and uh, Rafe Steinhauer. In our design thinking breakfast, you're here today, uh, you know, what are we looking at? We are rewriting and recreating new um, connections in design. We're bringing people together to talk about design thinking. And we are, maybe you have not realized this. Um, you may have been a guest here before. We do this in a really intentional way. We've been centering the experiences of women, people of color, people from the South, of the United States and people from the global South, um, people from outside of the main design thinking hubs. And this is us then trying to kind of push back on the establishment and um, you know, sharing testimonies, sharing stories, connecting people, networking, and again, discovering the beauty of, um, of our knowledge. And you know, sharing, working together, you know, it's a different kind of uh, practice uh, when it's done through a decolonial lens. Uh, another project um, that I'm sharing that was done, you know, through a decolonial lens, uh, you know, we did this workshop with the police department of all places, right, uh, not directly the police department, the Crescent City Core, but in this kind of challenging way where we said, okay, can we use design in the future to build shared experiences, and we brought together the police and, and the community and laid down the conditions of, of this work together. So we would only bring the police in if we had an equal number of participants. All of the participants were people of color, um, you know, and the, the police wasn't allowed to use their, um, to wear their uniforms. It, it could not be, we didn't want that identification of, we were removing the power from the police in the workshop actually. Um, and it was a very transformative workshop, you know, both for the members of the police who came in, you know, um, and, and the residents. So this is about connecting, envisioning, negotiating. Uh, democratizing research methods through something like Design Thinking Gumbo, um, which is us taking these methods that might be um, kind of normally pristinely away in an academic center, you know, or a design studio, and then bringing this stuff out to, to the world so that we could kind of flatten the interaction, again, removing hierarchy. And this is about creating, discovering the beauty of our knowledge, sharing, and then transferring power. Um, the, the leaders, the, the heroes of the design thinking gumbo are the graduate assistants um, and the, I mean, you never saw me at Design Thinking Gumbo, um, but this again is us working in this kind of decolonial, um, different kind of focus, less on hierarchy and more about flattening. Hello from the Pluriverse, um, it's, it's about us rewriting design textbooks. So sharing testimonies, storytelling, discovering the beauty of our knowledge again, um, sharing again, you know, and so this is the kind of challenge that I would put out to other people. If you want to think about the de, um, decolonizing design, what's the textbook that you think is missing and can you write it, right? Or can you get together a group of people and write it? You know, we have to break some of these um, 
these principles that have been driven into our heads that okay, design is about the Bauhaus and that all of these, all the information comes from the space. Um, we can rewrite this work. And so just to share a little bit more about this podcast, uh, the students interviewed about 30 something designers from all around the world. So when you look at this um, image, you have a New Orleanian designer who lives in Austin, you have a Brazilian designer who lives in Canada, and then you have Rafe Steinhauer, who is our former visiting assistant professor. And so what do we do? We ask them all the same question, people from all over the world, and then we're able to um, it'll be an ongoing process where we'll be able to analyze and kind of uh, move design away from that very pristine space or design history away from that very pristine space. All right, I'm looking at my time running along. All right, so you have to check that out. And then our, another one of our big projects, Pivot 2020, Pivot 2021 is coming up and it'll be, be hosted by OCAD University. But we achieved so many of um, Linda Tui Ways Smith's themes, you know, in this kind of work. So, you know, I'm sharing all of this, um, all sorts of provocation to other people in design to see, okay, what are you actually gonna do in design to decolonize this space? Um, lastly, this other project that we did about uh, math and, you know, trying to see how could we make math more accessible to ordinary people. And I know decoloniality is not everything, you know, um, you know, people, some people will look at these projects and say, well, how could all of this be around decoloniality? But it is this, it's, it's the same theme that's driving the way these projects um, projects are executed. So um, my own kind of terms around decoloniality in action, you know, it's about decentering, recentering, pluriversality, criticality, emancipation. It is chaotic, it's equity centered, it's inclusive, access, um, accessible, that's, that's what it should be, experimental, questioning, challenging, resilient, resistant, and unapologetic. So I'm gonna stop there, um, but I'll share the slides. And there are additional um, slides at the end of this part of the presentation. So I guess we are going to entertain like a few questions before we're gonna, you know, we'd like to go into a kind of group activity afterwards. I don't know if anyone has, let's see if we have anything in the chat that we, if not, I guess I can start to pull up the activity. Naisha and Edson, y'all could also watch the chat to see if anyone wants to jump in. I think Leslie, maybe I can also ask a question as, um as a way to also then connect like what we were talking about um because like as you had pointed out that um you know you're, uh, you're coming from trinidad and coming from the philippines i think what a lot of people are also thinking is that okay is is decolonization only uh possible or only the work of people who were formerly colonized right and so some people would think that, oh, you know, then maybe decolonizing is not necessarily for us because, you know, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a former colonized. Uh, and so I wonder what you think about that in terms of, um, because like, I think that's what we're also trying to do is that we're trying to expand decolonization um, and not just simply a process that is experienced and also that needs to be done by the former colonized, but it is us actually a task that needs to be done overall, right? And I wonder like what you thought about that. And then, you know, because that's also something that I hear a lot in terms of like who, who does decolonization and then who, who is responsible for decolonization? Gosh, that is a hard question, but it's everybody, you know, like I'm going to push back more because the, um, I don't see myself represented in spaces, but people who are from identities, you know, or backgrounds that are maybe closer to the former colonizers or 
also have to do this space of pushing back, you know, because everybody, um, I mean, this sounds like, this will sound very kind of kumbaya, and think, you know, but everybody benefits from these, it's, it's like, like how racism affects everybody. You know, if we let these colonial structures or if, if we let these spaces perpetuate, everybody's affected, you know, by not being able to fully participate in, um, yeah, in the world. I agree, you know, and I think like what what also re what reminds me often about what you just said is that the idea that uh, by decolonizing and therefore, for example, expanding the voices and the identities that are also being included, I think like one of the things that strikes me also is that you know this is not a zero sum game, right? And I think a lot of people think that like oh, just because we're decolonizing, then somehow. Uh, we're already sort of taking away the rights, let's say, of the white male, you know, I mean, that's always sort of the discussion, right? But it's not, you know, and, and you're right, like, it's about creating a larger space for everyone. And, and I think that's sort of the goal of, of that. Um, and, and liberation is not just for one, right? Like, it's liberation, in fact, like for everyone. Yes. And, and, you know, one thing that um, we, we should emphasize as well, you know, decolonization is, um, is different things to different people. Right. Uh, you know, like there is the, um, so, you know, as a person from a, fo a former colony, I have a specific experience around decolonization, but, you know, decolonization in, for example, a Native American um, context really is about the land um, or, or not that it only is about the land, but you know there, there may be other themes in different places as it moves around. It's it's not this one um, monolithic concept. It's going to look different for different people. You know, like I, last summer, um, I was going to give a talk about decoloniality, and someone wrote back to me and said, "But your your um, your con your your talk is not about the land, so we don't want you to use that term." And I was horrified. I'm like, what do you mean I can't use this term? You know, this is part of my experience, you know. Right. So there's also that kind of policing um, that, that sometimes happens, you know, of people who are talking about this. And, but we have to remember that it is different things and it's described differently in, you know, in different kinds of literature. But the question is, the question I pose to people is, what are you going to do? Okay, you know, right. what is the action that you are going to do to bring around this liberation, emancipation, change, etc. Right. And and I think also that because and and I, again also kind of like the conversation about like well you know like so there there's no more you know colonialism doesn't exist anymore right like supposedly you know politically countries have become free uh, but that's also not necessarily true in some cases right in some areas of the world and and also the kind of uh, argument. Um, that, you know, for example, what I was mentioning with Partha Chatterjee early on is that then for me, like also that the struggle and for a lot of like post-colonial societies is that it's, its legacies are affecting even until today that, um, and, and I'll just give you an example, right, about ideas of beauty, right? Like, for example, in Asia, like a very popular cosmetic product are whitening. Uh, and, and I know this also exists in other parts of the world, right, where where because the standard of beauty is about a, a fair, pale skin, uh, which is brought about by kind of the colonial experience that exists until today, right? And so that's why the work doesn't end, you know, it hasn't ended yet and, and that it needs to continue. And, and as you said, you know, the action needs to happen and continue to happen until today and e even until the future, right? Yes. So um, DT Breakfast always involves some action. So um, I'm going to show you what this action is. Uh, and we're going to move you into breakout rooms for a few minutes. Please don't disappear. If, you, you know, if you're worried about breakout rooms, you don't have to disappear yet. But we'll explain what the action is, right? What are we doing? Um, you know, one thing I didn't mention you know, as like a, a decolonizing stance is um, it, it didn't come up as a theme in Tui Wei Smith's book, but co-creation, I think, is also um, connected to a different 
worldview. And I really enjoy using co-creation in projects because I think that, um, I think that Western in quotes, um, ideology really focus on individualism, but it's important for us to move to this co-creation um, space for us also to push back on, you know, what's considered the hege um, hegemonic kind of practice. So we have created this mural where we are going to be looking at co-creating decolonial principles, you know, asking people, well, okay, what are you going to do? Okay, so we're going to put you into some groups. I didn't tell Naisha how many people, but he, she'll figure it out, maybe about five people. She's an expert at this already. Um, the question is, you know, how might we, using this design language, decolonize design or your discipline if you're not coming um, from design, discuss in your groups and see if your group can add three to five principles to our shared manifesto um, in mural. Okay, and you can add more post-its if you need. Uh, how do we use mural? If you click, I'm going to share the, the link in the chat. If you just click on this, you can immediately start typing and your, um, your comment will come up. Uh, when you enter mural, you'll have to put in a, 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 a name, you'll have to name yourself. And then if you are struggling with murals, someone else in your group can probably be the recorder and put your post-it on, um, on the mural for us if necessary. If you run out of mural, um, of post-it notes, because you know we have this big group, if we run out of post-it notes though, you can just click next to any post-it notes, double click on it, and you'll get another another one that you can add. Um, if you want to be really fancy, because we're chaotic, you can change the, the post-it note to the color that you think represents decoloniality for you. But we're going to just put you into groups for a few minutes to discuss the question and then add some principles. I've said three to five, but actually, if your group is really excited and you want to add 10 principles or something like that, you can go right ahead and do it, okay? So I'm gonna put the link in the chat and uh, Naisha, when you're ready to break, open the rooms, you can break us, put us in the breakout rooms. And I look forward to seeing everybody soon. Hi again. Uh, let me open up my chat. I forgot to, my apologies to everyone. I was going to share before people went into the breakout rooms, I was going to share the Google Doc with the uh, additional um, slides that I forgot to, well, that I knew that I wouldn't finish within, um, Edson and I were supposed to talk for seven minutes each and I had like 3000 slides, but you can see that some of the other points in the manifesto that Rachel Liam created. Um, and that, you, you know, like even for me to cite Rachel, you know, who is, maybe an almost unknown designer researcher in public health in California, um, a woman of color, that becomes like a decolonial type of act as well. You know, whose knowledge are we gonna push forward and celebrate? Um, I can't see Edson anymore, let me see. Okay. Yes, I see yeah, you now. <laughs> <I'm here. laughs> uh, so how was that experience for people? Uh, and I know that we're going to share, but I just wanted to check in with people that chaotic experience of co-creating this mural. What, what, maybe? Okay, all right. Um, I'm going to share screen again. Oh, where did it disappear to? Uh, this is, I'm gonna share screen, but I'm gonna actually have to move from right, okay, so you should be seeing again, right? All right, so our, our manifesto has changed in the last few um, minutes, which is cool. And we see here, um, you know, in our decolonization, we're going to give land back to indigenous people. Um, it'll be inclusive of different cultures. I'm just gonna skim so that we have like a few minutes just to chat again at the end, um, focusing on community and social impact look at issues of positionality with awareness, um, challenges status quo in hiring processes, um, nice red protest, decolonial post-its here, 
uh, about epistemic disobedience. Oh, how exciting. Asking critical questions about knowledge. And um, so, you know, this is an exciting co-created document that I hope that maybe, you know, we will send this out to you. Um, we'll clean it up and send it out uh, to everyone. So I'm gonna stop sharing again, or, or actually I could ask, um, let's see, I can't see people. Edson, I'll ask you because I could see you now. Um, what's your uh, feedback take on this activity? Or yeah, wherever you want the discussion to go. Yes, like I, I think, um... I, I thought that um, we had a great discussion also in our in our uh, small breakout room, um, and what I appreciated also is that then um, we we have different voices, you know, in the room, um, and then somebody actually also pointed out just looking at the participants and what what struck what well also then I didn't realize immediately that most of the participants in this uh, DT breakfast are women. And um, which is great, you know, because then uh, it made me think also about like, okay, so do men and, and don't need to think about decolonization, which I think then points out to what I was, was uh, highlighting earlier, you know, about kind of the shift um, from kind of like a very patriarchal male centric point of view. But, you know, um, it, it, it was something that struck me. So, uh, and, and, um, uh, so I think this is great. You know, this is great that we're we're discussing this. That's a really great point, Edson. Actually, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing for a bit so we can see each other. Uh, and I know we have like just a few minutes, uh, so I'm gonna, as I said, stop sharing and see if we could get some people in the audience to um, comment on what they added to the um, to the manifesto. And any, any comments that people want to add? Anyone wants to raise their hand and chat? Catherine. Thank you. We weren't able to um, work out the technology to add to the manifesto. So I wanted to, to mention, um, I have a background in academia. And so one of the things we were talking about is that the academic challenges to, to pushing the notion of decolonization. So for instance, uh, in many of your, your earlier comments, thinking about the you know, textbooks and rewriting the, the history, one of the challenges I'm running into as I am coming up for tenure is that co-creation is um, not uh, um, thought of as being particularly academic in the research. So for instance, I have a, a a couple of chapters in a book that I've um, worked on that um, have 23 authors, 23 very distinct points of view. And it's really being challenged uh, in the tenure process going forward because co-creation is not what um, um, the academic realm is looking for. And so, you know, as we're talking about this issue and co-creation is such an important moment in this process, uh, you know, how do we begin to change the, the, to use Edson's words, the operations, the practices, the systems that are in place um, that are stopping some of that wide dissemination. Kat, thank you so much for sharing that. And I think what you point out is really the, you know, when, when we were saying earlier about like, okay, you know, we don't need to decolonize because it doesn't affect us or that we're not. But that's exactly also the challenge is that then systems like education, knowledge, you know, production is embedded in ideas of uh, modernity, of enlightenment, which are, uh, you know, and, and we know we didn't really talk about uh, this kind of intersections between capitalism, uh, uh, modernity and colonialism, right? Um, but but that is uh, that is a good point. That's why it's such a large it's such a larger, more complicated problem as well. You know, because then it's as you know we're pointing out, like the system, it is not just changing one thing, right? It's changing uh, a larger system, which is not easy to do, right? Yeah, um, I'm just gonna give like a brief comment. Uh, 
you, you know, one reason why this um, work at Taylor is, you know, why it was why we were able, or, or I should say why maybe I was able to be so experimental is because it wasn't tied to tenure. And so, you know, then the work could be experimental um, and it could be seen. And, and that, you know, then maybe it, it's, maybe if it was seen and validated, you know, within a, a regular tenure process, because it's already been seen, now it will be accepted validated um but yeah it's just a big we just have to kind of keep pushing back little by little on the system um to see if we could get and that's maybe them. why centers like yours exist center exists because it can't exist right now in on its own within the academic system it has to be a a hybrid entrepreneurial process right um that allows shifts and 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 quick moves and thinking about that, which is something that often the academic environment doesn't allow. So centers like yours become incredibly important in this, this process, right? Because you can speak with another voice that others um, can respond to. Yeah. Laura? Hi, on um, behalf of my breakout group, we had Mercedes who's working in an industrial color lab. And that was interesting. How do we decolonize an industrial color lab? And I was thinking about who gets to choose the colors that are made in chemical labs that then color your keyboards and, and um, toilet seats, as Mercedes was explaining. So that was interesting. And then Laura um, Stargill with the EPA, who does um, environmental impact assessments. And, and so at, at a community, more community stakeholders in environmental impact assessments. And, and thank you. So this has all been great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sam? Yeah, I think um, during, in my group, I was expressing how I have like a very um, hard relationship with decoloniality. I like often dislike it. Like um, I like to focus more on liber liberation. Um, and I think Mm -hmm. One one quote that I found really powerful by um, um, Dick, oh my God, I can't remember her name right now. She's the co-founder of Girl Track, um, Morgan Dixon. Morgan Dixon. Yes. Um, she was saying, what, when someone was asking, how are you de decolonizing or dismantling certain spaces around public health? She was like, I'm not. <laughs> I, it's not my job. I didn't create these spaces. Um, I'm more interested in uh, creating and carving out liberatory um, like spaces so people can thrive. And I think what's really interesting is that decoloniality is so t closely tied to uh, positionality. So, you know, I'm, m I am not decolonizing spaces that are oppressing black folk, but I can definitely be doing that when it comes to like um, my cisgenderedness. So like really um, decolonizing spaces where trans people are not being centered or um, ableism. So I think like really often when I think about decolonization, I think about black people and then I'm just like, ah, I'm interested in doing that. And um, there are definitely spaces where decolonization is really important, but I can't think past it because I work at a predominantly white institution and that's like, like at the forefront of my mind. Sam, Thanks, yeah, Sam. <laughs> that, it, it's really, and, and, and you know, I always say also that um, if, if we had already achieved decolonization, then we're, we're not gonna talk about this. And that's why we're still talking about it because it hasn't been achieved yet. Right, so that's why the the fight still continues, um, and the work still needs to be done. Yeah, and I think you know some of the work looks similar. Um, there's a, a really famous paper that says decolonization is not a metaphor, um, but you know, it kind of talks about where there's some of the similarity. And so, like in Trin Trinidad, I might talk more actively about decolonization, and in the states, I talk more about anti-racism, I suppose. But some of the work is similar, you know, about decentering um, hegemony, you know, uh, um, yeah, the, the establishment. 
I know we're at time, so I'm going to just hand back over to Naisha for any of our last announcements. Naisha. Well, thank you so, so much to our guests um, for, you know, coming out and doing this amazing um, presentation. I just want to um, say, because I saw some comments in the chat that links, presentations, videos will all be posted on the Taylor website so you can um, see those things again. Um, so I just want to give a special thank you to our interpreters, um, to our captioners, but also a really, really special thank you um, to Dr. Leslie Ann Noel. Um, she will be leaving the Taylor Center. Um, so she will no longer, I know, cry. She will no longer be our um, co host, me, my co host for um, future design thinking breakfasts. But we do have, um, you know, the uh, future design, my future co host here today, Dr. Julia Lang. So you will um, start to see her face um, more during the summer. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Dr. Noel, if you wanted to say any kind of last words, um, and also you, Dr. Lang, if you would like to introduce yourself. But thank you so much for coming. Um, I did drop um, Dr. Noel and Dr. Cabalfin's uh, LinkedIn in the chat, so please feel free to connect with them. And thank you. Also, there is going to be another Design Thinking Breakfast in May, so I'm putting that link into you, Naisha, if you want to talk about that more. You're on mute, Naisha. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Um, I just want to say, you know, thank you to everyone who joined us on this. Um, you know, like why I like Fanon's quote is that, okay, you know, sometimes you're in the process, people would say, I think people didn't actually say, but I think that the work might have looked chaotic sometimes, but it is chaotic. You know, and so I want to thank people who joined me on this two year chaotic um, experimental journey. And I look forward to remaining connected um, to people at the Taylor Center and Tulane as we move on, as I move on. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And really, Naisha is the one that is leading all of the breakfast. She's the one that has recruited the, our incredible speakers already for the summer. She has them all slotted. And I'm just really excited to be her co-pilot, but really just support her in the amazing work that she's doing, bringing in um, so many incredible voices that can share their perspectives about their work in design. So Dr. Uh, Leslie and Noel will be very missed, and she is going off to do incredible work in a tenure track position. So she will stay close to our our hearts, even though she will not be um, directly working with us in the Taylor Center. So I look forward to seeing everyone during the summer uh, DT breakfasts. Thank you for being here and continuing to be part of this community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.